Well, Keith, thanks for joining us uh, the Flip Learning Network to talk about things you've done, things you are doing and, and going to do. So uh, welcome to this interview. Well, I'm happy to be here, Andrew. Uh, we've known each other online for a little bit, and uh, I think we really both believe in, uh, in the Flip Classroom, so it'll be fun to talk with you. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, probably the best place to just start is just what got you started. You've, been, you've had your YouTube channel for a while, but for folks who yeah. don't know, sort of thumbnail sketch of, of things you've done. And, uh, when I first started teaching um, early on in my career, around uh, 2000, I got involved with a program through the University of Buffalo called City Voices, City Visions. Um, I went on to run that program, but basically it was a video production course for teachers um, to enable them to do video production with curriculum in the classroom. Um, so as I stumbled my way, you know, kind of into that, you know, kind of gaming pedagogy, I realized, you know, I needed more time in the classroom. So really, like the flipped class just, and well, I don't think we called it back then back, but I just needed time in the classroom. Um, so early on, um, I'm not the biggest tech nerd, but you know, I could buy an MP3 recorder or one of those things and um, got burned audio CDs in the beginning, um, handed out DVDs and maybe a couple of VHS tapes. And luckily YouTube made that a lot easier. And uh, other than dealing with the digital divide, you know, it's really been, you know, a lot of fun to do. And like I said, I taught for a long time in the classroom and we, we made hundreds and hundreds of films. Um, and that was due to, you know, a flipped classroom. And this was in, uh, you're in Buffalo, right? I'm in, yeah, I should have started with that, right? Uh, yeah, I'm from Buffalo, New York. Uh, I taught at McKinley High School, um, which is kind of a nice urban diverse school in the middle of Buffalo um, for my whole tenure. Um, a few years ago, I switched over to instructional technology and doing a lot of video production, uh, but mainly to, you know, focus on, you know, the YouTube work and really to hope spread, you know, hopefully spread the message of, of what we're doing, not, not just to have kids watch videos, uh, but to really free up classroom time for teachers to do the hard work and the, the pedagogy inside the classroom um, to get kids to, to think and make decisions and learn. So you, you kind of addressed this already, but sort of what were you expecting when you started uh, to be able, making these videos that you said a little bit about like, some of the tech things you were going through at the beginning and how that may have evolved, but what were you expecting your audience to get out of this and has that sort of changed over time for you? I don't think it's changed. I, I think from the very beginning, um, I, I, I knew that, that it, it was better to get the content out of the classroom. And that's always been a struggle. And I know some of us struggle with that today with the digital divide and how do we do that? But early on, it was a lot of manual labor. It was a lot of burning CDs and mm -hmm. doing whatever I had to do. Uh, kids would come in early and we you know, listen to it together sometimes. But it was all about freeing up classroom time. And even now when I make my YouTube videos, um, you know, for the most part, I'm aiming them at the heart of curricular matters, you know, trying to present social studies lessons that are unbiased. So teachers, again, you know, you, you, you still could be a great lecturer, but I don't think that's what makes you a great teacher. Um, I think, you know, facilitating learning experience is what you do. And I think that us on the flipped end who are doing production more, are, are providing a service to those teachers to make them better at, at the craft of teaching. So if it, uh, were you expecting teachers, I mean, I don't know if you ever even had this happen to you, has a teacher ever come up to you or do you imagine a teacher out there might just be, their whole direct instruction is your videos that, that they're assigning. I just wonder, how, how would you feel about that? Is that kind of what you're expecting? Um, or is that, that not what you- what, No, that wasn't what I was expecting. Um, and I'll be honest, like if, if, if they're doing it and they're, they're doing that without, facilitating those powerful learning experiences, then I think it's a little bit of a jip for the kids. Hmm. You know, they'll, they'll pick up some content pieces, you know, they'll remember some silly things that I do, uh, but, but, but that, that doesn't mean that they've done learning. Um, but, but if someone's using it the right way, um, and by the way, that means more views for me because they're not watching it inside the classroom, but if we can get kids to watch them at home and make that their homework, because there's not a lot of decision making when you're doing explicit instruction, you're receiving content. And with you know, programs like Edpuzzle and uh, you can and whatever, play pasta, there's a whole bunch out there. You can, you can have that, that automated, where you can check for your curricular questions, you could get your state, regents, whatever, SAT questions, AP questions in there, and, and have and kids will do that. And you're not jipping kids who might not be able to do homework, A, because they need someone to help them, right? B, <laughs> Because it's just not feasible a lot of times. It's a, it's a crazy house. They don't have anywhere to go. But they can lay in their bed and they can look at their phone or they could, 
you know, nowadays hopefully make that an easier process, they'll do that, especially if they know that they need that content, not just to pass the exam, but because they're making a podcast the next day or they're doing production or they're, they're doing something with the content. So I forgot the question, but that's my answer. No, no, I was just wondering how, how you expect teachers to use them and yeah, yeah. someone I, I, who has applied yours, because I teach uh, eighth grade, so a, a lot of the content of your videos, honestly, sometimes would be maybe a little above the heads of Yeah, of, I, of I waver. Guys. So I've used yours as, as enrichment uh, for students who clearly got what I wanted them to get on one level, and it's one of the options, or that's one of the ways that I've, I've used them anyway, so that fits with what you're saying. And another thing I would say is that, that I, like, nobody can be enough. Like, you can't just assign me or assign Betts or Richie or whoever, um, and you can't just assign video. I think that we have to think, you know, we hear these buzzwords like differentiated learning and multiple intelligences and multimodal literacies, because it's true, <laughs> because there's different kinds of learners and they need different kinds of content, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, exhalers or whatever you want to call them. Some kids do really good with a textbook. Some kids need, you know, to, to match. You know, some kids need um, somebody who's, you know, more straightforward, or they might need more visuals than I, I, I provide. But there's some kids, I think there's a good, you know, 20%, 30%, whatever it is, of where I work for that type of learner, because they don't know how to control their attention yet. I think that's the kind of kid that I can engage with because of my funny face. I, I mean, the way that I, you know, tell stories or explain things, um, but some other kids might think it's cheesy and drift off in their attention. The goal is to get the content to them where they're going to be paying attention. If you're not paying attention to, if they're paying attention, then 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 I don't know what you know. It might not work out. So. Um, and so we sort of talked uh, the past few minutes about how your approach may or may not have evolved. What about just the the tech piece of it? You hinted about this uh, uh, at the beginning that you started off with burning CDs or DVDs. Yeah. Uh, MP3s and so on, and now you've got a YouTube channel with, with you know, what, 600 something videos last I checked. So I wonder how your production has evolved um, from the beginning. I mean, as someone myself who's sort of seen your, your different versions, but for, especially folks who haven't, how has your, your approach evolved? I see you in front of a green screen right now, so that might be part of the answer. It's just because my room's messy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that there's, there, there's, there's two answers to that. Number one is like the tech, the tech piece, you know, and we could ask this question about, about anything in life, you know, how is your, you know, making phone calls evolved or watching TV evolved or making videos evolved? It's gone with where the tech is gone. You know, if you're interested in something, you know, you might, you might catch up a little bit later, but eventually you're going to get pushed along that wave um, and you're going to adopt to, to whatever system is available. And obviously the systems are better now and they're, they make it easier to do fancier things. Let's put it that way. But that doesn't mean fancy is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think the second part is the more that you do anything, the more experience you do, the more you learn about it, um, the more you learn how to do it faster and to do it better and to make different options. So, you know, sometimes I'll make that, that, that conscious choice that I don't need to layer this video with, with 30 different, you know, crazy multimedia objects because my audience might be a different audience than something I would do that with. Um, so I think experience and anybody who's doing this and, if you want to make a video, go make a video. I mean, there's no other answer other than do it <laughs> and then do it again and again and again until you don't want to do it anymore. And, and if you don't stop liking it, you'll keep doing it and you'll get better. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's one thing I was going to ask you is to advice that you'd have for anyone getting started or maybe sort of in the middle feeling like they're in a rut. And I, I guess some of that advice you've already given would just be just make videos and, and keep going. It, Anything specific, anything you found in your, in your time, if you could start over or something like that? Um, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to do that, to kind of be too reflective in terms of if I'd make a different choice because it, it wouldn't happen the way that it happened. But I think if I was giving somebody advice, you know, I, I'll say, I'll just say it again. You have an interest for a reason. You know, there's a reason why you're thinking of doing it because you're supposed to do it. Um, and that doesn't mean you're going to be the next John Green in Crash Course but it might mean that you're gonna save some more kids that you would have saved if, than if you didn't do it. And, and uh, the second piece, it sounds stupid, but just keep doing it. You know, nobody wins, you know, you know Pac-Man on the first time, you know? Did I make a Pac-Man reference? Wow. Right? Yes. Nobody wins the video game the first time, right? Um, but, but I promise you, 
if, if you, you enjoy doing it and you don't mind making mistakes and fixing them, you, you'll get better. And then don't worry about where it's going to go. <laughs> worry, just worry about the decision in front of you in terms of you know, how you're going to make that video and get it done. So it's not about having the perfect microphone or the perfect app or Camtasia or not, just. No. That'll come, that'll come. And beg like a, like a gypsy, like, you know, like email everybody, ask everybody, keep you know, banging your, you know, the door down. You know, I, I, you have to, I was very aggressive about getting equipment because it was important for me to help my students learn. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's donors choose or you're borrowing stuff or don't let it stop you if you don't have it, but it's almost like it becomes like, you know, not like a hobby, but, but, but something that just draws you to want to do better at it. And you'll do anything to be, be better at it. But, but you won't stop doing it if, if, if you haven't gotten better. I'm getting confused. Yeah. No, I think we got it. <laughs> I think we got it. <laughs> um, so, so um, of course, you're a social studies history teacher. And you've name dropped a few, Mr. Betts, Tom Ritchie, and, and other folks in that, that vein as well, who some of our audience might be familiar with. Um, do you have a sense of sort of what making a social studies or history, even a humanities video kind of approach, how that might be same or different with sort of the STEM world, which is uh, what a lot of our, our flipping audience and flipping community tends to be? Or do you really see it as, as basically the, the same group doing the same kind of thing? I, I think it's B. I think it's the same. They're doing it differently. But, you know, when I when I taught at the graduate level and we, we did like, uh, you know, uh, digital literacy and, and multimodal, you know, stuff like that, it didn't matter who was sitting in front of me, curricular wise. You'll make different curricular decisions and you'll make different decisions about explanations and ex being explicit and showing and all that kind of stuff. But the concept's the same, that you want them walking into the room kind of understanding what photosynthesis is. So they can do that, that laboratory experiment. I just winged some science right there. So I don't know if that made sense, but. <laughs> no, that's, that's a word. No, that's a STEM word. Is that a word, photosynthesis? I yeah, listen to NPR Science Friday, so I pick up a little bit. <laughs> but it's not a story. I mean, that's one thing I wonder about. I mean, for the humanities or something, like you're telling like it's stories about, it's or a, something. It's about, but it's a, it is about engaging attention. Right. It's about engaging attention. So if, 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 if you're just going to put, you know, a PowerPoint together and you're just going to put words up there and think that kids are going to be engaged and it's going to help them, it's, it's probably not. They might watch it and they might check things off. But I think that we need to engage them on a different level. And some kids need a face. Some kids need, you know, a little bit of a human relationship with the person on the other end to be able to make them laugh a little bit, to draw them back in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and some kids are fine with Khan Academy you know, where they can just watch overviews and that's fine for them. But we have to get out of the rut of thinking that like there's one type of methodology to learning. You know, I think the pedagogy is the same, but I think that we need to know our audience and who our students are and make, make those types of decisions, whether we're math or science or humanities, about what's the best way to distribute content because there's content in every subject matter. Obviously history is more of a story than maybe mathematics, but you know, there, there's, there's people that, that do, the math thing really great online and engage in cartoons and weird things and so yeah I, I think it's the same and then looping back to what you said before also just that it's going to connect and be actually applied in the classroom with something we heard you say earlier too right yeah it, it can't just be done for done sake and then you do test prep in the, in the classroom the whole goal is to make a classroom a playground you know, we went through Ed Reform for a long time and data, 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 and everyone still talks about data here and there, about data having some type of measurement of learning. And there's probably, you know, truth around the edges there. But the way that I always in, I kind of judged whether learning was occurring was I'd ask the kids how many decisions they made during class that were important to them. And just guess, put it on a number and drop it in a hat or whatever. And that was my, my, my kind of temperature about whether I was, I was facilitating an, a learning experience I wasn't a teacher, I was a conductor. I used the stupid term fall, right? A facilitator of learning experience. So you have to make those types of decisions and let the videos do the other work for you. You know, the up front of the classroom, you know, explaining stuff. So you can start switching your focus onto facilitating learning. The first thing I ask people when, when I do PD is where does learning occur? And they all say the same thing, right? In school, everywhere. Right? I'm like, no, it only occurs in the brain. You're all, you're all, you're all wrong. <laughs> Sometimes I know I'm right, and I know that learning happens in the brain. So therefore, we have to figure out how we can facilitate the learning that occurs in their brain. 
So just so I get this right, so you would ask students at the end of a class how many decisions they had personally yeah. made. Yeah, just kind of, yeah, they knew it was coming, you know, and it, there was no names or anything like that. And if you have a really good relationship with your kids, they'll answer honestly. Some kids, you know, bad day, put zero, they zonked out for the day. But that was my gauge. How many, just ask, your, ask yourself that question right now. How many real decisions are they making? Because if they're not making real decisions, they're not doing deep learning. They're doing superficial learning, right? And that might get them, you know, be on the test and get them in a college or something like that. But they're not thinking, we use the terms, critically thinking, authentic learning, all that nonsense. But that's the gauge of it all, is their attention and how many decisions they're making. And those are the two things that you should be thinking about before anything else, attention being the first one, right? You can't fly a kite with no wind. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the wind and you can't conjure it up, you can't just go to the faculty room and, you know, complain. Kids, they don't pay attention. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it? Right. <laughs> I'm so doing I'm going to do that tomorrow. I mean, I have an idea in my mind of what they would say, but sure. you know, yeah. to find out yeah. and it's our gauge. It's not for the administrator. It's not for, you know, data, man. You know, they, they said I had to put data on my wall. Right. It was like part of like the round robin checklist. So, you know what I did? I printed a picture of the kid from Goonies out. His name is Data. And I put his picture up on the wall. And I got written up, and I was okay with that. <laughs> Sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's worth it. But my principal, she kind of liked me, so. <laughs> um, one thing I want to make sure before we wrap up here, um, since you've been kind of in the game for, for quite a while, where do you see this video flipping, learning, whatever you yeah. want to call it thing. Where do you see this going maybe the next two, three, four years or so? Or, well, um, I hope we just have- Where do you see yourself going you know, in this, in this well, vein? The, the, the field first, I think, that, I think that we should have better, better, more options that are easier to access. You know, I don't, and I don't mean corporate filters. Don't, don't be mistaken. You know, the, the textbook companies have figured this out. Um, you know, I, I've been doing videos for Pearson. I'm, you know, I have been. Because they understand how important engagement is and they're doing these immersive learning kind of projects now because they understand how important it is to get kids to make decisions. But I'm hoping that there'll still always be like, you know, like alternative music, like this like vibrant field of individuals who practice the, the game. Um, and, and, you know, you know we, we, I say that don't be the singer, be the conductor, right? But damn, I like to sing. <laughs> and, some, and some teachers like to sing. Um, and, and that's the way that I, I, I could still do it without wasting time, you know, jumping on the radiators and, you know, pretending to be George Washington in, in my classroom. So you could do it on a green screen now. Right. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, as for me, we'll go where the wind goes. So we'll just keep making videos. And, uh, you know, I love the field of education. And hopefully, uh, you know, I can have some type of impact on it. Like you. That sounds good. That's all we can really, can all, yeah. all we can really do, right? That's right. Um, well, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk to us and record this video, Keith. Yeah, it was uh, nice to finally meet you. Yeah. 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 No, no. This yeah. is a nice excuse, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Now back to fantasy football. Right, right, yeah. right. Yes. The flip fantasy football league. That, going uh, down. Is out there. <laughs> We're both doing pretty well so far. Yeah. We'll talk about it later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the Bills. So there's that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah. hope the audience... Uh, gets to see this and enjoys this video. All right, we'll talk to you again soon. Sure, uh, well, I started teaching in 99, um, and I actually, let me turn my phone off and start that over again, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stupid phones, kids these days. <laughs> so I've been teaching, I taught for 17 years in the classroom,